Good morning or afternoon or evening. Welcome to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to this community, this resource where our goal is to help you develop the habit of getting into Scripture every day. It is a habit that will change your life because that's what God's Word does. Yeah. My name is Rebecca. I'm a pastor with the Church of God. I get to be a host here at the Scripture Habit. I say welcome and it is an honor to get to be any part of your journey where you're getting into Scripture. I hope that scripture becomes less intimidating and that you fall in love with God's word. I'm going to wait just a second for friends to join us and let me know that the signal and everything is good. Uh, We are in Proverbs 29 today. Guys, we're almost finished with the book of Proverbs. We've been following this habit of a proverb a day, whatever day of the month it is. <clears throat> corresponds to the chapter of Proverbs that you read. Today we're in Proverbs chapter 29. So it's good. It's good. Hey, Darlene, good morning. Happy hump day. <laughs> yeah. Guys, thank you for <clears throat> letting me be with my daughter and her, her uh, school yesterday. They had a, uh, a competition and they needed someone to uh, be on the bus and travel and chaperone and stuff with the kids. So thank you very much for letting me do that. I am excited to be back though. I missed you guys. In fact, I even brought my Bible yesterday and my phone and I thought, hmm, if I can just get enough time, I'll even just jump on and we'll just read it together, even without the screen stuff. But uh, but it was pretty, pretty happening yesterday. <laughs> hey, Gloria, good morning. Good morning, how are you? It's good to see you on here. All right, guys, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray and we are going to jump into Proverbs 29. Let's do it. Hmm. Good morning, Lord. Good morning. We set our attention on you, Lord. We turn our heart toward you. We want your word to speak to us, to come alive in our hearts, we pray. Help us in your name. Amen. Amen. John, good morning. Judy, good morning, guys. All right, let's read Proverbs 29. Here we go. Verse 1. One who becomes stiff-necked after many reprimands will be shattered instantly beyond recovery. When the righteous flourish, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, people groan. A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father. But one who consorts with prostitutes destroys his wealth. By justice, a king brings stability to a land, but a person who demands contributions demolishes it. A person who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. An evil person is caught by sin, but the righteous one sings and rejoices. The righteous person knows the rights of the poor, but the wicked one does not understand these concerns. Mockers inflame a city, but the wise turn away anger. If a wise person goes to court with a fool, there will be ranting and raving, but no resolution. Bloodthirsty men hate an honest person, but the upright care about him. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise person holds it in check. If a ruler listens to lies, all his officials will be wicked. The poor and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. A king who judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. A rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. When the wicked increase, rebellion increases, but the righteous will see their downfall. Discipline your child and it will bring peace It will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. Without a revelation, people run wild. But one who follows divine instruction will be happy. A servant cannot be disciplined by words, though he understands he doesn't respond. Do you see someone who speaks too soon? There is more hope for a fool than for him. A servant pampered from his youth will become arrogant later on. An angry person stirs up conflict, and a hot-tempered one increases rebellion. A person's pride will humble him, but a humble spirit will gain honor. 
To, a, to be a thief's partner is to hate oneself. He hears the curse but will not testify. The fear of mankind is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. Many desire a ruler's favor, but a person receives justice from the Lord. And the last verse, verse 27, an unjust person is detestable to the righteous. And one who is, whose way is upright is detestable to the wicked. All right. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi, Melanie, Brenda, Flo. Good to see you guys. This proverb, so we're getting to the end of Proverbs, aren't we? And for friends who might just be visiting us for the first time today, I want to remind you, these Proverbs are words of wisdom that have been collected. The purpose of this book as it was written, um, we attribute Proverbs largely, not completely, but largely to King Solomon. And it was a collection of wisdom that he was hoping to impart to his son. Now, King Solomon is known for being a king that desired wisdom. He wanted to rule with wisdom. And a cool thing about King Solomon, so a lot of, uh, I'd say, I guess, the bloody war part of the kingdom's history was with his father, King David. When Solomon came in, uh, the kingdom experienced rest. It experienced wealth. Yeah, which... Can we get a mad thing? Because we see that King Solomon indulged in a lot of stuff. Um, but we see that this is kind of how he collected this wisdom. He led a kingdom into wealth and prosperity. Yeah. Hi, Georgia. Good morning. All right. So I, I've been sharing pretty much every day. I grab a summary of the section of Proverbs uh, from the Holman Concise Bible Commentary, HCBC. This says in this section, starting with chapter 28 and going through the end of 29, the powerful and wealthy often exploit the poor. Oppressors govern without benefiting the governed. They know nothing of justice, amass fortunes by exorbitant interest, and ignore the needs of the poor. Lawlessness brings down societies and families, and people groan under oppressive rule. Governments should establish justice through law, but in the end, justice comes only from God. I loved that. I loved how that summarized it. Uh, David Gusick, in the beginning of the chapter, specifically of 29, he points out this, rulers, servants, and the fear of man. Rulers, servants, and the fear of man. Now, um, again, this, this was written toward um, ones that would have positions like kings, right? Because he's writing to his son that would probably take his throne. However, uh, these words of wisdom can be such sources for you and for me even today. And I think of anyone that's in a leadership position, right? Because you have a measure of influence. You have a measure of decision-making power. Um, you have people that report to you that you should be caring for, right? Um, so we all could learn from this, from this book. But what I would say, inevitably, there's going to be a person there that's like, you know, I have no authority. I'm just, you know, the doer. I do stuff and I, I don't have a say in anything. I might challenge that just a little because I feel like everyone has some measure of influence in their little sphere. It might not be at your job, but maybe it's in your home. Maybe it's in your social group, right? Um, but even if, even if you would say, I can't apply any of this leadership stuff, what I would say is that this book gives incredible wisdom for me and for you about identifying who is wise and who is leading in foolishness or wickedness or selfishness. Yeah, this is good wisdom for us. Yeah. All right. So, all right. As I mentioned, we're not going to be able to go through every single verse. So I just kind of picked a couple in each you know, section. The very first one, verse one, the one who becomes stiff-necked after many reprimands will be shattered instantly and beyond recovery. Maybe something about that. You ever have where you read verses and there's, I don't know, I just say it hits you in a weird way. Something about the, the words maybe. It's like, hmm. When it said this person is going to be shattered instantly beyond recovery, I was like, wait a minute. 
what are they talking about? So that, that's what kind of drew my heart to look at this verse, all right? When it talks about someone being stiff-necked, that's a, a Bible language to say stubborn, someone who's really stubborn. They're stiff-necked, right? And it says here, let me go back to it. It says, after many reprimands. So this person that they're describing, not only are they very stubborn, and it could be stubborn against authority, it could be stubborn against God, uh, someone that wouldn't want to admit that they're wrong, but people have to keep addressing things with them, and it's like they never learn. Uh, it says there, after many reprimands, meaning not just one time that they're being stubborn or foolish, but this is a pattern of behavior, okay? The result for that person were those words that caught me, that said those pe people like that, they will be shattered instantly beyond recovery. It isn't necessarily that it's, you know, that the tides suddenly change for them because they've been getting warnings the whole time, right? Uh, with their behavior, with their whatever, they've, they've been getting those warnings, yet something will inevitably happen and it'll be beyond their ability to just write off. Um, they can play denial as long as they want, but inevitably something's gonna come and it's going to feel like it just destroyed them. They might not recognize all of those other corrections could have prevented them from reaching that point. A fool usually doesn't notice those things, yeah. Okay, the other thing too, I loved this, verse two, and I feel like, guys, this is a good, this is a good piece of wisdom for anyone in leadership. When the righteous flourish, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. This is saying, hey, so the person that's given a measure of influence or leadership to rule, if they're righteous, it says the people rejoice. Why? Because a righteous person considers the people that are serving under them. That word consideration, it's gonna come up a lot in this chapter when talking about leadership. Uh, a wise person is going to care for the people under them. They're going to consider them. A, a wicked person isn't. They're gonna care about themselves. They're gonna be selfish. And that's why people under a wicked ruler groan because they know that they're not being uh, considered or cared for. It's all the selfishness of this, this leader. Now, I, I, I point out on the slide, this is a principle, all right? Remember again, we talk about the differences. There's a precept. A precept is a command that God gives for how you're to live. A promise is when uh, God gives a word uh, of something that is kind of guaranteed to happen. That is a promise. Principle. Principle means that the overall guideline and direction of it is true. However, it cannot be applied in the same way as a promise. And I point this out because uh, even as I read that, look again. So when the righteous flourish, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. Maybe it's the people groaning. Maybe that part is what got, you know, kind of hit me to just remind us, hey, this is a principle. Why? Because some people will always groan. This verse isn't so much about, um, about us qualifying to decide if a person is leading righteously or wickedly by whether people or not are, are groaning. That's not actually how this verse is to be applied. This verse is to the leader and it's telling them that you should be caring about the people that serve under you. They should be happy to serve under you. As we're talking about that, I want you to think in your mind um, when I think of managers, people that I've served under, who have been really amazing, uh, people that I've enjoyed serving under, where I, I want to serve more, I want to make them shine, right? Like, it's because I felt that they considered me, and I felt that they were sincere and earnest, that they didn't have selfish intentions between, um, or, or motivating why they led. One of the greatest examples to me, just on a, a personal level, of a really amazing manager, uh, to me is my husband. Why? Um, I mean, his personality and I are, are very different. And at first I would say, oh, I don't know if I'd want to serve under his personality, because he's very direct. But on the flip side, I see him, like anyone that's on his team, 
he cares for them. He advocates for them. And I've seen him take people on his teams that other teams would write off and say, oh, they're no good, you need to get rid of them. And he's cared for them. He's shown consideration and respect and dignity to them. And man, they rose to be some of his best team people. I've seen that. So he embodies this verse to me. I, I see it in my mind and heart um, when I think of how I've watched Tucker lead. He's a really good leader. All right, let's keep going. All right, verse seven. A righteous person knows the rights of the poor, but the wicked one does not understand these concerns. Um, this here, knowing the rights of the poor, this is more than just caring for someone who happens to be poor. Knowing the rights of the poor means that they, um, they advocate for the poor. They can see and recognize and they take very seriously if someone who is poor is being taken advantage of. They know the rights of the poor. And here's the other thing, is they can understand circumstances and influences or situations outside of that individual who might be poor, outside of their control that could be contributing to their situation. They understand the rights of the poor, all right? A wicked person, they just say they don't understand that. Why? Because they don't really care. A righteous person is going to see that. They're going to have dignity for the person. Yeah? Awesome. Um, a wicked person is selfish and does not care to seek or learn how to care for someone else. Yeah, that's true. Verse 9. If a wise person goes to court with a fool, there will be ranting and raving but no resolution. This... I highlighted it because I don't know if that feels real to you, if you've experienced anything like that. Listen, a righteous person, first of all, the only reason a righteous person would ever try to go to court would be for resolution of something. A fool, their motivation for going to court is not resolution. A fool's interest in going to court is because they want to... Uh, highlight how they've been wronged. They want to make all sorts of rants, all sorts of claims, and it's really just about them justifying themselves and wanting to cut down another person. They're not interested in resolution. And so righteous people, you need to consider really carefully who you're interacting with or trying to bring resolution because a fool is just not going to be interested in ever getting there. They only want to rant and rave about their position. Have you experienced this? I have. I've experienced this. Have you? No? Let's keep going. I want to know your thoughts, by the way. I know I'm kind of going through them uh, fast because I want to be mindful of time today. Um, but I want you to put in the comments any verses or phrases that stick out to you guys. Number 11, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise person holds it in check. We see we see that lesson over and over and over again in Proverbs. I mean, for if you've been in the journey with us, this doesn't sound like anything new. Why then do they keep repeating it? Because it's so important. And we need the reminder, don't you? Yeah, a fool gives full vent to his anger. He's going to be upset about it. He's going to totally rant off on it. A wise person, a wise person will keep it in check. They will consider what they say and the ramifications of it before a word ever gets out of their mouth. Yeah, right? Key difference. And, and for you and I too, not only I don't want to be a I don't want to be a fool, right? I want to be a wise person when I am interacting. I also want to identify the other people around me who are wise, right? Those are the people that I want to have counsel with, right? Darlene, I love your feedback there. That's good. Thank you. Verse 12, if a ruler listens to lies, all his officials will be wicked. Accepting wicked counsel sets someone onto a bad path, period. You need to be mindful with whose words you take to heart. A, a ruler, so someone again in influence and authority for decision making, um, 
The, thing, the decisions they make impact the lives of other people. That's the reality of leadership, right? You need to be oh so mindful that you do not take counsel from someone who is not wise because it'll lead you on a very different path. And then suddenly, if you're taking advice from them, the other people around you are also going to start to, to have that same posture, maybe selfish interest, not considering other people. That'll be the path that you go down. Gotta watch it, right? All right, keep going. I hear my mailman outside. There we go. Okay, there's two verses here, 15 and 17, that talk about discipline. And specifically, um, Verse 15, a rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. And then 17, discipline your child and it will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. I know I point this out a bunch because I've seen it used the wrong way. The Bible talks about discipline a lot and the need for discipline and that a parent is going to, a, a good parent is going to want to discipline their children. But listen, the discipline that is spoken of in the Bible is not merely beating someone into submission. That is not discipline at all. That is authoritarian, right? The discipline that's mentioned in scripture has a purpose. It is training. That's what discipline is. It's training, right? And the goal, the goal of good discipline for any parent is to build them up, not rip them down. People, I think people, you've experienced this. So we're not going to spend a ton of time. People take discipline sometimes and they think that I'm going to make them submit to me. I'm going to make them, you know, break their spirits so that they fall in line. That is not discipline. That uh, That's abuse. Discipline, a heart of a parent that submits to the Lord. Your goal is not that they submit to you. The goal is that you train them to submit to authority, to submit to the Lord, and that when you're not there, that they can make wise decisions, right? That takes training, not submission to you. Yeah. It's different, right? The goal of discipline is to build up, not to tear down. A parent who understands their role in the life of their child will take it seriously. Instruction, training, building up, right? All right, verse 20. Do you see someone who speaks too soon? There is more hope for a fool than for him. So this builds on the one that we just saw where it was talking about anger. A, a fool like vents their anger right? But a wise person keeps it in check. Now they're saying, do you see someone who just speaks too soon? Another example of someone not being wise. So wisdom we see shows that uh, what you say and when you say it are marks of a wise person or a fool. A wise person is going to have restraint. They're going to think about the words they say before they speak them. And they're going to consider when is the appropriate time to say it. I know, I need to be reminded of that too, right? Lord, help us be wise with our words. All right, verse 22, an angry person stirs up conflict. A hot-tempered one increases rebellion. It's just a reminder. Um, the nature of us when we're angry is not resolution, is it? That's just, that's just a reality. When someone's angry, they're wanting to stir up anger. So, listen, anger itself is not a sin. That's a feeling, all right? It's what you do when you're angry that's a sin. And so this proverb challenges you and challenges me that if you want to be a person that wants resolution, right? Which means things being restored and brought back together, not continuing in conflict. Then that means if you're feeling anger, friend, then you need to let that pass before you think you're going to step in to try to resolve something. Because anger is only going to stir up more conflict. Anger is only going to breed more tension. It's not going to bring resolution at all. And so we just got to be honest with ourselves, right? Is there anger in my heart? Then I need to step back and I need to address that, deal with that. You know, anger is just a feeling, identify it, but 
I shouldn't be motivated and moving in anger because it'll never get me resolution. Yeah. I wrote, if your goal is to resolve a conflict, you need to let anger subside before you try to address a problem. Why? Verse 22, because an angry person stirs up conflict. A hot-tempered one only increases rebellion. All right, the last section. There's one more verse here. Uh, Actually, no, I, I actually have three highlighted in here. This is just one on this slide. To be a thief's partner is to hate oneself. He hears the curse but will not testify. This is another one of those ones. Oops, there we go. Another one of those ones where I was like, oh, the words of this are really interesting and it just catches me. A thief hate, a partner with a thief hates oneself. I wondered what that meant. You, I, you, you read something and you're like, hmm, I don't know what they're really meaning by that. So I, I went to a great resource that I love. I quote here often, Enduring Word with David Gusick. Uh, he wrote, to partner with a thief is to reject wisdom and to embrace folly. The one who steals from others will steal from you. And perhaps with violence threatening your own life. So to be a thief's partner, if you if you knowingly partner up with a thief, you're asking for trouble for yourself. That's why it's saying you hate yourself. You're asking for trouble for yourself. All right, the last two verses we're going to look at are 25 and 26. The fear of mankind is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. Many desire a ruler's favor, but a person receives justice from the Lord. These two verses go really well together because they're highlighting this really big issue, this central issue, which is where do we put our trust? Who do we think is the one that advocates for us and protects us? Sometimes we may not realize that we're putting greater trust in man than in the Lord. Where we see this come to play is um, if you feel that you need to um, get buddy-buddy with someone or make sure you guys are on the same page because you need someone that's going to advocate for you for something. Um, that in itself isn't bad, but I'd ask, I'd, I'd come back, like, you need to check the motivation. A lot of times, and this is just human nature, right? Human nature is they see someone that has power or influence, so they want to become good with them. Why? Because then that person who has say, maybe they'll protect me more. That's putting your trust in man, the fear of mankind. Fear there, that word not meaning like scared of fear, but meaning this um, awe and respect and submission to that's the fe- the fear of man. If you're only looking to man's systems and man's processes and people of influence and power uh, to be what secures you up, that gives you security or peace of mind, you're looking in the wrong place. That role is is meant to be filled only by the Lord. And the writer points this out. The fear of mankind is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. Many desire a ruler's favor, but a person receives justice from the Lord. Who do you believe has the greatest power and ability to advocate for and to protect you? It's not saying that you, you know, turn your back on any systems or governance or any of that, right? Those matter. Those matter. And in this chapter, we see them talking a lot about um, a governing agency, like a ruler or a governing body that, you know, like a court that rules in favor of people. But here at the end of the chapter, it's saying, listen, at the end of the day, your greatest trust and peace and confidence is not in a system of man. Your greatest trust and peace and confidence is in the Lord. I pray today that that would be so for you and for me. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. We're challenged, God. We're challenged in uh, in growing in our own ability to uh, have leadership skills that are wise. We're challenged, Lord, in how we interact with others. We're challenged in uh, in what we say 
And when we say it, Lord, give us wisdom, we ask. And help us, Lord, remember that our greatest security, our greatest hope, our greatest confidence should be found and placed only in you. Help us, Lord. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, that's it for today. Tomorrow we're going to go into Proverbs 30. And uh, we're going to finish up the book this week, guys. Yeah, so do me a favor. Hit the share button. Can you invite someone into this study, into the book of wisdom? Right? We all need more wisdom. Right? Invite someone in. Hit the share button. I'll see you tomorrow, uh, closer to 830. All right. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, by the way. All right. Bye, guys.